How's it going, guys? We have a medium difficulty question for renal electrolytes, steps one and two. So we have a patient who has renal failure, normal creatinine 0 0.7 to 1.2, and we want to know what the electrolytes are going to be. So before you freak out with all the numbers here, it's going to be pretty easy to eliminate. There's a few simple rules you have to know for renal failure. I say medium difficulty, but quite honestly, this should be past level. You need to know that in renal failure, you're going to have low calcium, all right? And the, there's two reasons you have low calcium. One, the kidney can't reabsorb it in a late DCT the way it's supposed to. So normally PTH will insert an apical channel there that reabsorbs calcium. So if the kidney's fucked up, you can't do that. So calcium will be low in the blood. Second reason is you can't activate 1-alpha-hydroxylase in the PCT via PTH the way you're supposed to. So if you can't synthesize active 125-D3, the latter can't go to the small bowel to absorb calcium, hypocalcemia, decrease calcium sensing, decrease negative feedback to the parathyroid glands, PTH goes up, that's secondary hyperparathyroidism. So that's past level in of itself, knowing that calcium is low in renal failure on USMLA. So when we look at these answers, even if you don't know the normal ranges, which you should, you can eliminate some of the higher ones. So 8.4 to 10.2 is what calcium is normally. So I gave you, I didn't even give you any calcium in the normal range. You can eliminate these latter two answer choices. These are fucking wrong because calcium is clearly high. So we're left with all these other ones, all right? And then the second rule is that, so we're left with these six so far. Second rule is phosphate is always high in renal failure because you simply can't filter it out. There's other reasons more difficult. I mean, PTH normally prevents the, will help prevent the reabsorption of phosphate in the PCT. Okay, so PTH will downregulate apical transporters. But if you can't do that, you get too much reabsorption in the PCT, but you really can filter it. The point is, in renal failure, you're going to have high phosphate. So 3 to 4.5 is normal phosphate. So these first three answer choices are fucking wrong because phosphate's not high. So we're just left with these three right here. So in summary so far, okay? I understand the numbers are confusing and you have a lot of them here. In summary so far, these are the only three answer choices where calcium's low, phosphate's high. Okay, I mean, if this were an arrow question, right? So down arrow, calcium, up arrow, phosphate. We said calcium 8.4 to 10.2. Phosphate 3 to 4.5. I want you to know those numbers so you don't have to waste time on the USMLA looking up your lab values. Now, this is where the medium difficulty portion kicks in. You have to know that renal failure is known as uremia. That's the U in mud piles, isn't it? Which is the mnemonic for high anion gap, metabolic acidosis. And the way you calculate anion gap is you add chloride and bicarbonate together you take that number and you subtract it from sodium. And if it's 13 or greater, that's high. Eight to 12 is normal. Now you say, but wait a second, we don't know what sodium is. Doesn't fucking matter what sodium is because we can clearly make some inferences here. So firstly, normal bicarb, 22 to 28. If we have a metabolic acidosis, bicarb has to be low. So we can eliminate this answer choice fucking wrong because bicarb is borderline high. We're left with these two. Okay, so these are the two answer choices where calcium's low, phosphate's high, it's what we expect. And then we have low bicarb. And as I just said, some of you say, well, we don't know what sodium is. How can we calculate anion gap? Well, this is what NBME is going to do, OMG. So sodium normally 135 to 145, isn't it? So even though we don't know what it is, let's just assume. So And sodium can be variable with renal failure, which is why I didn't include it here. It can be low, sometimes it can be normal, sometimes even elevated, but let's just assume it's normal. So 135 to 145, let's just say it's 140. Well, with this fifth answer choice here, if we were to assume sodium is 140, our anion gap, so we add these two together, chloride and bicarb, we get 130, subtract that from 140, we get 10. Well, that's not elevated for an anion gap, that's normal so far. Well, if we look at choice D instead, if we add these two together, we get 120, subtract that from sodium, we get 20, which is an elevated anion gap. So even though you don't know the exact numerical value for sodium, choice D is correct over choice E because this one yields a higher anion gap regardless. And if you were forced to choose, you would choose the answer with the high anion gap. It's not me trying to be creative or tricky, it's what the NBME is gonna do. So in summary, 
you need to know that you're going to have low calcium in renal failure. You're going to have high phosphate. You're going to have low bicarb. It's metabolic acidosis. You're going to have a high anion gap. It's the U in mud piles, uremia. And if we added potassium, you should just know that potassium is going to be high in renal failure as well. Choice E, wrong fucking answer. You know the deal once you make more content, build my subscription channel. Appreciate your time. That's it.